Hi there, you're listening to The Steve Schramm Show, where we train Christians to become confident, passionate servants of Jesus so they can grow in their walk with God and share their faith more persuasively. Welcome to the show. I recently had a question come up about um, Neanderthals and caveman, things of that nature. And it was a, it was a, a kind of a general question. It wasn't necessarily a, a specific thing about them. It was just kind of like, where do those kind of fit? Because you hear about these things in different popular level, you know, even movies and TV shows. And of course, it's no secret. You learn about these things in science class. These things are common ideas. And the most common idea, of course, is that these things such as um, Neanderthals and cavemen and these other forms of ancient, so to speak, hominids, the deal with them is that they supposedly lived millions of years ago. And of course, that would be kind of standard conventional dating chronology that is accepted in the sciences today. And many Christians feel that the conclusions that they draw are adequate, at least to some level, right? You have people on different sides of this. You have someone who would want to affirm that they are evolutionary ancestors. You would have some that want to affirm some sort of relationship, but not an evolutionary ancestor. And so how do we really think about that from a a Christian perspective? Well, you know, it's a really big question. There's actually lots here to this question, a lot more than we are going to cover in this short episode. Um, I did do a little bit of a... um, Uh, more in-depth writing on this. It's on the website. I will link us up to that. You can find that on the website. It deals with um, Neanderthals and and reasons to think that they were human. And so let me just uh, allow that concept to drive us toward a conclusion here of the question. Neanderthals are human. At some level, at some level, Neanderthals are human. How do we know this? Well, demonstrably, we have Neanderthal DNA in our bodies right now. Some have more than others. Um, I know one fellow who has went ahead and had himself genotyped, and he is aware that uh, his particular gene that is a contribution from um, his Neanderthal ancestors helps him to have less back hair. So, um, ironically, a man for him. That's uh, Less back hair is a good thing, but that's a discussion for a different day. So, what do we make of this? Um on a young age creationist time scale. So let me just go ahead and reiterate that right now. If you're just joining us for the first time, perhaps, or something of that nature, I am a young age creationist. That is, I believe that this earth and universe and everything you see around you can be no older than somewhere between six to 7,000 years, probably. You say, that makes you a kook. Okay, well, um, you know, you're welcome to think that. I arrive at that conclusion based on a serious exegetical study of God's Word and also a very serious understanding of the scientific evidence for and against the view. I understand when the science works for the view. I understand when the science works against the view and more work is needed to be done. I recognize both sides of that equation. Um, So I I don't think I'm a kook. I think I'm a pretty well-reasoned and well-argued individual. And I know lots of other well-reasoned and well-argued individuals who take this tact and take this path and take this view and uh, have their reasons for holding and defending it. Now, this, of course, bucks pretty hard up against the standard dating timeline that is accepted by most mainstream scientists. And this would include Christians and non-Christians, it's all across the board, all across the spectrum. And so we have brothers and sisters who think that Neanderthals are um, evolutionary uh, cousins, to be precise, of humans, of Homo sapiens. They would be kind of like evolutionary cousins, okay? The problem gets to be when you look at the Bible's teaching on being made in the image of God and just exactly 
what it means to have Neanderthal DNA flowing through our body. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the idea of the image of God, and I would be remiss not to mention that. Um, my own views are maybe even a little different today on that than they have been in the past. Um, I think it's kind of hard to argue, actually, that the image of God is something that is necessarily bound up in some sort of quality that is maintained by the human um being okay so it traditionally you know one of the thoughts is that you know the ability to commune with god or something like that would be being made in the image of god to have us do to be body soul and spirit to have that kind of spiritual nature to you etc there's probably some 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 something there there's probably some um, ontological status to that but more and more i'm coming to understand the image of god as to be a a a matter of function that god um commanded and god decreed really that humans would be image bearers okay that that human beings would be image bearers so the question that has to be answered is what does it mean to be human and and i think um that uh my interview with Stephen Lloyd. Steve, Stephen Lloyd just really brought this out. I would go back and listen to that if I were you. It's a long episode, but a good one. And he really made this clear and was able to elucidate this by asking some questions. And one of the questions that he asked in our interview was, what does it even mean to be human? What does it mean to be human at all? And um, when we start to think about Neanderthals and things of that nature, what we have to do is ask that question. What does it mean to be human? Can we say that what it means to be human, that part of what it means to be human is to have Neanderthal DNA flowing through our veins and the Neanderthals not be human as well? Okay, now this is the core of the issue. This is the Neanderthal problem, okay? If you have Neanderthal veins, ne- excuse me, if you have Neanderthal um, DNA in your body, okay, right now, then that means either one of two options. You have only two. Neanderthals are human or Neanderthals are non-human and the entire human race is the product ultimately of some form of bestiality. Okay. Um, Now, I hate to be crass and perhaps I should have given a warning first if you're listening with your kids. Okay. I'm trying not to be um, overly you know, unsensitive or anything like that here. But to me, this is a problem that I don't think has been adequately addressed. And if you are if someone who knows uh, of a way to deal with this, or you have, from an old age Christian perspective, if you have resources uh, that specifically answer this question, then um, fine. The resources that I have seen go ahead and bite the bullet on this point, and I'm not willing to go there. Um, I'm not willing to say that humanity is the product ultimately of a uh, of that kind of relationship uh, of of some sort of um, intermixing between humans and humanoid looking animals. Um, again, as was made clear in my conversation with Dr. Lloyd, the more and more we research, Neanderthals are looking more and more human. The article that I referenced as well gives five different kind of behavioral points that point to Neanderthal humanity. Plus, we have the biological thing to deal with. So, all in all, the evidence shows that Neanderthals were human. But now we extend it to another part, another kind of piece of the Neanderthal problem. If Neanderthals are human, when did they live? If Neanderthals are human, when did they live? Well, if they lived before Adam, then we have this problem. However, if they lived after Adam, then we don't have this problem. Here's a crazy question. Was Adam, I'm not going to answer this question, but but here it is for you to think about. Was Adam what we would call today a Neanderthal? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't. I think it's possible. I, I think that there is a, um, th- there are certain qualities and things that as, as moderns we associate with humanity. And actually there's been studies to this effect. Dr. Todd Wood talks about this. Um, 
that w- when you see somebody who is a human being, but nevertheless, they look different than you, like they have some sort of disease like elephantitis or something crazy like that, you actually dehumanize them in your mind. Now, they're no less human than you. They're still homo sapiens, right? But you actually, in your mind, even if subconsciously, you are dehumanizing them. You view yourself as something different. And um, Wood specifically suspects that something very similar is going on with this idea of a Neanderthal. Some of the, um, frankly, indoctrination that has gone on throughout the years has made people think that these are wholly other. But as we uncover more scientific evidence, the irony is, is that they are not other, right? They are like us in very many respects. And so what, as a young age creationist, what I want to do is, is really reckon with the fact that, hey, maybe these things are human. Maybe, maybe these things are human. Maybe that's what they were. And it is in our kind of um, foolish, I think, thinking that we, that we dehumanize them. But if they were human, okay, fully human, and that means image bearers of God. That means that they come after Adam. And that means that they have to fit within that time scale. Now, I don't personally have a problem with that, right? Because I, I, I view the time scale issue as something as a function of a dating um, problem. Are there Neanderthal, you know, skeletons and um, bones that date further back than Adam if we're looking at conventional dating? Yes. Uh, but again, I think that th- that is a different issue entirely. If we're just talking about the Neanderthals themselves, is it possible that they lived after Adam? I believe, yes, it is. And you say, well, what about all these things? What about stone tools and cavemen and these other ideas? Well, I would encourage you to take a read of Dr. Wise's, um, Dr. Kurt Wise. He wrote a book. It's a dated book, but it's a good one in 2002 called Faith, Form, and Time. It's a little hard to get your hands on. If you can't get your hands on that, check out Paul Garner's 2013 book, The New Creationism. It discusses a little bit about this as well. And what you're going to find is that in a properly formulated flood model, we have pretty good reason to think that after the dispersion at Babel and things of this nature, you would expect to find in different colonies spread all throughout the different regions of the earth, especially in the Near East, you would expect to find some of these stone tools. Life had returned to a very primitive state. They had been on the earth for a couple thousand years at the time of the flood, and after the flood, everything was destroyed. Noah and his family were left to populate the earth. And from there, from from Babel, they had to basically spread out and start all over again. It's no surprise. And by the way, cave dwelling and things of that nature, we see that stuff in the Bible, okay? We have no problem with cavemen. We have no problem with stone tools and things of that nature. I'm not worried about those things because it makes perfect sense. The storyline, if you take it, starting with the Bible as the authoritative source of history, if you start there and go from there, you see no problem with these things fitting. Now, That's not to suggest that there are no problems at all. Yeah, we still have to do the science. We still have to reckon with these things. I'm certainly not saying that that there's no difficulties. I would never make a statement like that. Um, I'm also not saying that we have it totally figured out with respect to some of what was going on in those chapters. I've recently come across the work of Dr. Heiser, and uh, while I haven't I haven't overturned anything that I already thought about those early chapters of Genesis. I have added to my knowledge of what uh, kind of another whole dimension of things that is going on there, a whole second dimension to the story, a more spiritual dimension. But I don't think that at all takes away from the historicity of it. Neither does it take away from the human element. We still have a flood that destroyed all humans, save Noah and those that were with him on the ark, and they were left to populate this earth. And in that framework, in that scenario, we have reason to think that there would be lots of this hunter-gatherer activity going on that, that folks talk about. We would have these Neanderthal tall light creatures their bone structures would probably be different they would um have made stone tools and things of that nature to get by as they learned how to build cities and deal with agriculture you can fit all of those kind of elements into a properly formulated biblical understanding of 
history. And so that is how I would encourage you to think about those things. Uh, again, some good reading. Um, Searching for Adam. We did a whole series early in the podcast back when it was called the Creation Academy on that book. I would still encourage you to go get that book. Uh, Searching for Adam, Genesis and the Truth about Man's Origin. That's a really great book. Um, Bones of Contention by Marvin Luvenau is another really, really great book. Uh, I've already mentioned Faith, Form and Time by Dr. Kurt Wise and um, the New Creationism by Paul Garner. Again, these are all resources that I would encourage you to check out if you're interested in how to think about uh, the supposed evolutionary ancestors and evolutionary cousins of humanity. All right, I hope that helps you, and I hope that um, really just gives you kind of a, a short and concise and clear way to understand how these guys might fit into uh, a biblical framework of history. So I love you. I thank you for joining us this week, and uh, again, go check out the resources at steveschram.com. You can find all kinds of stuff there to help build your faith and share your faith more persuasively with others. We love to teach theology and apologetics, so um, get your hands on as much of this content as you can. Thank you for joining us again. We love you. See you next time. Bye-bye.